Hello, and welcome to Consumer Frank's podcast. Today we explore the battle for a European standard on cabin air quality. We examine the latest interventions by American and European airlines and test their claim that the new draft European standard is cost prohibitive. I am Frank Brehenny. A few days ago, a flight was en route from London to Paphos in Cyprus, when the flight developed a serious problem. As the aircraft was making its descent into Paphos, the first officer noticed a strange smell in the cockpit, which they likened to onion budgies. At this stage of the flight, the aircraft was descending from 8,000 to 6,000 feet. The captain confirmed that he could not detect the smell. Moments later, the first officer began to experience tingling in his arms and legs and thought he was going to faint. The first officer followed protocol and donned his oxygen mask and ensured that their oxygen was set at 100%. The first officer then turned to the captain and indicated that he did not feel well, but the captain didn't respond. He then told the captain that he considered that he was incapacitated, and still the captain didn't respond to him. Moments later, the captain did respond by stating that he didn't feel too good either. The captain donned his oxygen mask and both pilots confirmed that the captain's oxygen was set at 100% also. At this stage of the flight, it was noted the course from Papos Air Traffic Control to descend to 4,000 feet went unnoticed. The pilots partially recovered but could not establish two-way communication with each other. The captain maintained his control over the aircraft and began pointing his instructions to the first officer as to what he required him to do with regards to the different stages of the flight. Thirteen minutes later, the aircraft landed at Papos safely, and after touchdown, the pilots opened the cockpit windows and brought the aircraft to the stand for passenger disembarkation. Once the aircraft arrived at the gate, the captain immediately went to the toilet, whilst the first officer checked with the cabin crew whether they had noticed anything untoward. The crew reported they had not noticed anything, but they observed their shock at seeing the first officer being completely pale, along with a strong odour of fuel coming from the cockpit. Both the captain and the first officer continued experiencing tingling sensations, confusion and difficulty in being able to concentrate. They were both taken to hospital and diagnosed as having a low blood oxygen saturation level and a fever. They were recommended to stay overnight in hospital, but they chose instead to return to their stopover hotel and return the next day as passengers, both apparently refusing to fly on the aircraft on which they had experienced these problems. The aircraft remained on the ground for 27 hours and returned to London the next day. It is not clear what, if anything, was found in any examination of the aircraft following this flight. On another flight a few days later, travelling from Austria to Dublin, not only did they experience communication failures due apparently to faulty equipment, but also smells or odours on board. The cabin crew reported an unusual smell within the cabin of menthol or disinfectant fluid, but after a few minutes this had dissipated. During the cruise part of the flight, a woman passenger fainted and was given medical treatment by a doctor on board. It was not established what caused the woman to faint, but a medical team was called for their arrival in Dublin. However, as the aircraft started to descend, The cabin crew detected the smell of dirty socks. The same smell was also confirmed by the first officer on the flight. Whilst the flight crew reported no ill effects, the cabin crew reported that they suffered with dizziness and headaches. It is not clear from this report whether the cabin crew were medically assessed. I noted from the report that the said airline is apparently under heightened monitoring by their aviation regulatory body. 
Now, these recent cases reminded me of another story told to me directly by the pilot concerned about a flight on approach to Birmingham Airport in the UK. He told me that as the flight was descending, both he and the first officer became ill because of the fumes or smell they had experienced in the cockpit. He described how difficult it was to think and to carry out his duties as a pilot. However, such as the skill of these remarkable men and women, he somehow managed to guide the aircraft through a safe descent, and as I recall, he told me that at about some 300 feet or so from the ground, he opened his window to allow fresh air to enter the cockpit, so helping him to partially recover to bring the craft to a safe landing. Now, none of these stories are unusual, and all accounts I have heard over many years from professional pilots and crew speak of an exposure to a fume, odour or smoke and its effect on their ability to safely operate the aircraft. Beyond these terrifying experiences, and the many professionals I have spoken with, lies the prospect of years of ill health, lost jobs and dreams of flying shattered. I would also add that I've spoken directly with passengers who have been equally affected by their exposure to a fume, odour or smoke event on board an aircraft. In the case of passengers, they are left completely in the dark about what has happened to them, many recounting in more serious instances of crew running up and down a smoke-filled cabin wearing oxygen masks believing that their plane was going to crash. I am also aware that for some passengers, they too suffer with years of ill health, a lack of medical care after such incidents, and a medical profession that is baffled by the symptoms that are reported to them. For me, as part of my consumer advocacy role, I have been inspired by these accounts and brought these experiences into my own campaigning role. Many ask me if I have experienced such incidents, and I think it's true to say that I have experienced fumes on board an aircraft, but I have learned that these can come from preceding aircraft in the taxiway, burning fumes from a faulty in-flight entertainment system, or the smell of cleaning fluid that may have been spilled, so I am not close to the possibility of other sources. However, on one flight from London to Bordeaux, the fumes at the back of the aircraft were so strong as we taxied to the end of the runway and at takeoff, the man next to me suffered with a mild asthma attack and a sense of disorientation. In that case, I explained to him what I thought was going on and helped him by offering him my own inhaler. He recovered quickly and at my urging, he reported the incident to the crew. On another flight from Birmingham to Amsterdam and on approach to Amsterdam, I experienced what many flight crew report, the strong odour of smelly socks. Now I suffered no ill health effects, but on arrival at the gate I reported it to the purser and spoke with the captain who recorded the incident. As a footnote to this, I reported the matter to two civil aviation authorities and the airline and despite my own consumer experiences, I received some very closed-door responses from these sources. I never established what the cause of the smelly socks odour was. So my campaigning on this distinct issue has brought me into contact with many flight professionals and senior members of the aviation industry. I have met senior civil servants and senior staff from the European Aviation Safety Agency. I have even met members from the EU Scientific Committee, recently tasked with European taxpayer funds to establish facts, information and solutions to this serious problem. I am not only a member of the European Standards Committee, I am the head of delegation for UK standards on this topic, but also a passenger representative on the US standards body, ASHRAE, both of which are tasked with creating a standard, not a law, a standard, to bring airlines and manufacturers onto the same page to minimise, reduce or remove the risk of fumes or odours on board aircraft. This is highly contentious work, and I can say that my representations or views are not universally welcomed in some quarters. 
The resistance comes not from the fact that fumes can enter into the breathing environment, but that they can cause the reported effects or health problems. It is the causation argument. In other words, yes, there is or may be a problem with fumes getting into the cabin or cockpit, but you can't prove that these have made you ill. This latter argument, like any personal injury case, is always one of contention. But, and the industry know this only too well, it is clear that over the last 10 years, the publicly available peer-reviewed research into the effect of toxic fumes, be they from a single or multiple set of compounds, or latterly from particulate matter, does have an effect on human health. If it didn't, then why do airlines quietly settle their claims with pilots and crew? Clearly they recognise that there is a greater litigation risk if they run into court with the many cases now on their desks. Equally, why have insurers decided to allocate funds to pay for the risk that they know is there? So for the present, we have the aviation industry travelling the world attending as many standards-making meetings as possible, trying to create a standard in their own image, with the crew and passenger cohort struggling to be heard either by the standards bodies, or more importantly, the political regulatory bodies who are supposed to keep us safe. At this time in Europe, we have indeed, despite all the naysayers, created a draft standard, agreed by a good cross-section of aviation users and aviation industry that should go some way to revolutionising how fumes on board an aircraft is detected and dealt with and how the health of crew and passengers is guarded whilst embedding in the precautionary principle into this area. We started this work in 2012, but the first European Standards Meeting wasn't until 2015. Across the globe, all eyes were on this committee, for its membership is like nothing else created on any other continent. Across Europe, the final comments have now been made, and we expect to meet in January 2020 to resolve those comments into the draft and hopefully approve the draft standard in February 2020 for publication. The important thing to remember about standards is that they are entirely voluntary. As I said earlier, they are not law. There are no obligations placed on any company or organisation to use the standard. Just one important note on regulation. In Europe, we have the implementing regulation, which sets out what is required from aircraft manufacturers, airlines, pilots and crew. In order to satisfy this principal regulation, the aviation regulator, EASA, has created, with industry, standards to accompany the regulation. When you visit EASA's website, you can see clearly that they make clear that these are not law. They're not enforceable. But as long as you can demonstrate that you comply with the principles of regulation, then in effect you are operating legally. This is what I call light-touch regulation and is one of the many reasons why the aviation industry travels the world seeking a standard that they can financially justify and comply with, something that confirms their best engineering judgment. So this is where we are in Europe, at the cusp of creating something new and dynamic, something compelling, something everybody should embrace. So with these issues in mind, out of the blue, two letters were received from Airlines for America and Airlines for Europe stroke IATA. I understand that these letters were sent to the European Standards Body, SEN, in Brussels. The thrust of the letters demonstrated their anger at not being consulted or being part of this standards-making process. In one of the letters, they claim that their members, who have extensive operations in Europe, had a strong vested interest in the development of this standard, but had only apparently heard about the European standard development in the previous week. 
An interesting point, because we would have had to have been operating in some alternate reality for airlines or the aviation industry not to have been aware of our work. In fact, some of Europe's major aircraft managers' personnel are some I am proud to call my colleagues on this European standards work. I also think it's rich for European airlines to complain that they weren't part of the process when, for example, we in the UK extended invitations to UK airlines, but all were declined. The letters also strongly object to parts of the introduction, particularly on the causation points I spoke about earlier. But I have a couple of observations. The introduction in a standard is the scene setter and generally provides no requirements. Secondly, in none of their letters did they offer text or authorities to support their position. At one minute to midnight, I would have expected more. But the curious thing about one letter from Airlines for America was the claim that if airlines were to follow the requirements of this draft European standard, then the cost to retrofit each aircraft with sensor technology would amount to €100,000. In fact, they claim it's not necessary because effectively there is no problem and the only beneficiaries would be the sellers of that technology. I believe that this figure of €100,000 may have emanated from a discussion at a recent conference in Washington, D.C. and probably reflects the current variable discussion about the costs of sensor technology. There is also the complaint in one of the letters that no objective reasoning or impact assessment has been carried out by the standards makers. I am aware that when European law or UK domestic law has been made, an impact assessment is carried out before the law is finalised. I am not aware of, nor do I believe, that the same obligation is required in the making of a standard. That said, if they had chosen to engage in this process, they may have been surprised at the objectivity within the room. But I want to think exclusively about the €100,000 claim and try to rationalise what lies behind that claim. In either letter, I cannot detect any overt comments that would suggest that the installation of sensors is not necessary, which tends to suggest that they impliedly accept that there is a problem of toxic fumes entering the aircraft environment. The alternative is that they do not accept that it is necessary to expend €100,000 per aircraft and therefore object to such a cost being imposed on them through a voluntary standard. Well, if the latter is the case, then there must surely exist safety and risk assessments to support such an argument. If they are relying on such safety and risk assessments, then you would expect them to produce all of these to demonstrate why they should not have to pay €100,000. But of course, nothing like that appears to have accompanied their letters. Secondly, I'm trying to gauge whether they are objecting to paying the entire cost of a retrofit, in which case the argument would surely follow that they could be opening themselves up to the accusation that they are putting costs before safety. Or is it the case that the airlines are positioning themselves legally for any eventual dispute with aircraft or engine manufacturers as to who should pay for any design faults or failures and aircraft retrofits? In objectively examining this claim of €100,000, I want to try and determine some form of cost-benefits analysis. So let's assume that Airline X decides, you know what, the risk of toxic fumes is there. We should mitigate the risk by following the provisions of this European standard and retrofit our aircraft with the sensor technology that will help in the mitigation of the cabin air quality problem. If an airline took such a position, then I would strongly suggest that they immediately work with their insurers to explain why they are taking this action. I would also suggest that whatever about historical claims, insurers would look favourably upon this decision and airlines would see a benefit not only of wholesale support from their insurer, but quite possibly reduced insurance premiums. 
It is also quite likely that Airline X would also receive the complete support of their insurer in making any potential claims against airframe and engine manufacturers in order to help pay for any retrofit due to any apparent design faults or failures. But I am the first to recognise that any potential litigation of this nature would take years to resolve, and so therefore, Airline X may feel that this is too an important issue to wait for the result of any litigation, and that they may feel the need to comply with the requirements of this voluntary standard. How could they persuade their board or shareholders to agree to take this action? I think the first consideration must be to consider the worst case scenario. What if on approach to a destination airport, their pilots became incapacitated and were unable to control the aircraft? Tragically, the aircraft crashed with the loss of all on board. Whatever about the subsequent inquiries as to the cause of the crash, there are two immediate considerations. The first is the damage to brand, particularly if it becomes evident that the pilots were incapacitated through a known problem or defect. The cost implications from brand damage is unquantifiable in this assessment because of the need to assess the known risk versus public political opinion. But for the purposes of this exercise, we should recognise the great potential for brand damage, which I would suggest would cause public and political questions of other airlines and their operations and the knowledge of risk. Secondly, assuming that the crash was caused by the pilots being incapacitated by fumes or odours entering into their breathing environment, and the risk of this happening was known by board members of Airline X, in the ensuing inquiry, the board of directors run the risk of being open to a charge of corporate manslaughter. Whatever about the obvious risk to directors, it will also affect the financial stability of the company and adds further to the problem of damage to brand. But leaving those aspects to one side, there is then the further problem coming from the surviving relatives of the crash, from compensation claims that they will no doubt make. While some listening to this may head to the provisions of the Montreal Convention as to compensation levels for death and injury, a simple fact is that air crashes attract compensation of around £1 million per deceased passenger or crew member. There are variations, and remember, other parts of the aircraft manufacture chain may also be sued. I know that this is correct because I have dealt with major air crash case and I am familiar with the arguments made, ranging all the way back to the Concorde crash at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. So if we assume that our crashed aircraft involved 200 deaths, that would mean that the bill for compensation would amount to 200 million pounds. The question then follows, how does Airline X mitigate this situation? The first thing to remember is that seeking to retrofit via any legal action could take years, thereby extending risks and reputational damage. Secondly, the €100,000 per aircraft found within these letters may simply be a headline figure extracted from discussions within the industry. It may cost less, but for present purposes, let's assume that the €100,000 figure is correct. So to help Airline X consider this cost, let's now look at the possible structure of two operating airlines, one from the UK and another from the US. Our UK airline operates 280 aircraft and carries 53 million passengers a year. The cost of retrofitting each aircraft, based on the €100,000 figure, would cost the UK airline €28 million. Euro. In order to recoup the costs of this fit, leaving to one side any potential action they may have with an aircraft or engine manufacturer, our UK airline could pass on the cost of this retrofit onto its 53 million passengers. If they split this one-off cost amongst its passengers, each passenger ticket would have an extra €53 Euro cents added to the price of that ticket. 
Our US airline has 940 aircraft and carries 200 million passengers a year. The cost of retrofitting each aircraft, based on the €100,000 figure, would cost the US airline €94 million. Euro. In order to recoup the costs of this fit, again leaving to one side any potential action they may have against an aircraft or engine manufacturer, our US airline could pass the cost of this retrofit onto its 200 million passengers. If they split this one-off cost amongst its passengers, each passenger ticket would have an extra €47 Euro cents added to the price of that ticket. Now, some of the board members of Airline X may question the annual servicing costs per aircraft of the introduction of this new technology. So let's assume that such a cost, because most of the work would be carried out in-house and through agreements of supply companies also working in-house, would be equal to €5,000 per annum per aircraft. This would mean a cost to the UK airline of €1.4 million Euro per annum and the cost to the US airline would be €4.7 million Euro per annum. If you then pass on the cost to the passenger, this would translate to €3 Euro cents per UK passenger and €2 Euro cents per US passenger. There could be arguments made by board members of Airline X that if they took this action unilaterally, they would be giving an advantage to their competitors because ticket prices are sensitive. It's a fair point, but the rebuttal must be that many airlines don't actually make a lot of money from the tickets, but from their ancillary sales. In fact, one US airline has recently demonstrated that 50% of their income comes from such ancillaries. The leading point has to be, we are Airline X. We care about our passengers and those that work for us. We know there is a risk within cabin air quality and we are going to do something about it by adopting this standard. We are going to make sure that when we say that your safety is paramount, we mean it. This is what we're going to do because we want you to fly on the best maintained aircraft in the sky. We want you to fly with us again and again and to work for us with confidence. That's the PR advantage, slam dunk. The board of Airline X can now choose to be either a leader of fashion or simply a follower, perpetually frightened of imagined legal consequences and aged arguments. To the authors of these letters I say this, I am disappointed to see the content and tone of the letters. It reminded me of the arguments and debate I've heard in the early days of my involvement back in 2006. The big news is that the debate has moved on and some from your side of the industry have taken that journey. You should join them. There are also those out there who accuse me and others of trying to destroy the aviation industry, to put them out of business with our lobbying, debate and constructive actions through this draft voluntary standard. To them I say, don't be so ridiculous. I don't want you to fail. I want what I see as one of the most important industries on the planet to succeed. But to succeed, you need to listen and act openly on the problem that is now well defined and is delivering a clarity of solutions. It is my recommendation that you should follow the example of Airline X and join them with courage for the benefit of your employees, customers, your shareholders and your brand. Until the next time, take care.